thanks very much uh, for coming. I'm, I'm really excited to be giving this talk, a, a little bit scared, as I'll say in a second why. Um, and uh, basically what I'm going to be doing is talking through some thoughts of my own. It's very much a working paper, uh, although it was interesting as I was putting the slides together, the degree to which it's a working paper that involves, uh, in some cases, material that's quite old. So a lot of thought going into uh, uh, something, uh, ideas that I've had for a while and, and I'm really wondering about. I've actually changed my title very slightly from uh, the version in the, in the publicity, um, although I see I've got a typo in it now, thinking about care principles in the digital humanities, why, why care, and I've put in maybe not only a matter for researchers working with Indigenous peoples, uh, the original version said is, and I'm going to talk about that as, as we go on. So the talk, as I said, is really uh, an attempt on my part to work through some issues to do with humanities data in an age of increasingly ubiquitous linked open data and linked open data infrastructure. I think uh, a movement that's as important as the rise of ubiquitous computing was, let's say 15 years ago, I mean, using ubiquitous in a, in a fairly loose sense, um, picks up uh, two major uh, strands of research data management and governance, findable, uh, fair, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reproducible, and care, collective benefit, authority to control, responsibility, and ethical. Um, and it applies into a question of a specific type of humanities cultural data. Um, this is something that we're working on on a new project called Good Things, uh, which is the, the use, uh, how representational data as a data type is understood in humanities workflows traditionally, and also how it can be understood by uh, research infrastructure developers. So what this isn't is a talk about indigenous data or indigenous research data management or indigenous research data management and governance. Um, as you'll hear in a second, my background is primarily medieval European philology, um, but I do live in an environment that's increasingly aware of settler indigenous issues, uh, also decolonization issues, which are a different thing. Um, but I also do have to emphasize that I'm not a specialist in Indigenous research or Indigenous data. And the paper is uh, preliminary and hesitant, and I hope learning, and I hope to, to learn from the comments uh, that come afterwards. I think there's a lot we can learn from Indigenous research and Indigenous research protocols as humanists more broadly, and indeed in an argument that we're making around campus here, I think that that element of how humanists interact with their material, really thinking about positionality is an important thing that we bring to data science uh, more generally. But at the same time, and this is the bit where I've, I'm, I'm very hesitant, we want to avoid the, you know, what I call the all lives matter uh, problematic, which is sure, all lives matter, but that's not the point of Black Lives Matter. Uh, we need to recognize and honor the unique nature of Indigenous data, Indigenous data management, and Indigenous data governance, um, and not necessarily think, oh, that applies to us as well. I think we have to recognize the uniqueness of it. Um, and we have to be humble and listen, especially uh, when we either don't know the answer or are wrong. So in broad terms, what I'm going to do is I'll start with the territorial acknowledgement. I'm going to just briefly show FAIR and CARE uh, the protocols and standards so that uh, in case people don't know what those are. I'll tell you a little bit about me. I'll tell you a little bit about the data project that's really been driving a lot of this thinking. Um, I'm going to talk then much more about the context in which these objects that we've been capturing uh, take place, because this is what's been driving my thinking on this. And then I'm going to ask at the very end, without necessarily answering it, can we use FAIR to operationalize CARE? And I guess the flip side of that is, can we use CARE to, uh, to be ethical about FAIR? So territorial acknowledgement. Okay, and welcome to the University of Lethbridge. You guys are watching me from, uh, not on the University of Lethbridge, but from the city of Lethbridge, which everything in this territorial acknowledgement also applies. Our university's Blackfoot name is Inaskim, meaning sacred buffalo stone. The university is located in traditional Blackfoot Confederacy territory. We honor the Blackfoot people and their traditional ways of knowing and caring for this land as well as all Aboriginal peoples who have helped shape and continue to strengthen our university community. 
Very first thing to do is to show you FAIR and CARE. Uh, I've got these two screens now showing them. These are simply screenshots from the, the main pages describing them. FAIR is an acronym um, that was put together by a variety of groups interested in uh, better data citation and better data research data management. Um, and it stands for fi uh, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And then you can see under uh, each of these, some of the subparts. Um, I'm, I'm actually not gonna go through those because the FAIR should be fairly well known, I would imagine in a DARIA audience. Um, but in broad terms, it means that uh, however we handle linked data, it should be findable, should be accessible, it should be interoperable, and it should be reusable. The CARE principles are a set of principles that were designed to um, govern, perhaps is the best word, uh, the use of FAIR in uh, work with Indigenous data and Indigenous communities. Uh, and its main uh, points are that data use uh, and data ecosystems shall be used for collective benefit, uh, that Indigenous people will have the authority to control their data, that those who work with Indigenous data have a responsibility to share how the data will be used uh, and to assist and to use that data for uh, in, in Indigenous people's self-determination and for their collective benefit. And that the use of Indigenous people's uh, data and their rights and their well-being should be the primary concern, the primary ethical concern at all stages of the data life cycle and across the data ecosystem. And this has a number of subcomponents, which I, I will actually just read out. It's worthwhile doing those. I won't read the descriptions, but just the headers. Uh, so collective benefit, it should be for inclusive development and innovation. It should be for improved citizen, uh, for governance and citizen engagement. It should lead to equitable outcomes. For the authority of control, uh, data use should recognize the rights and interests. Data should be, uh, uh, should be used for self-determination and effective self-governance. Uh, and Indigenous peoples should have the right uh, to develop cultural governance protocols uh, and to be active leaders in the stewardship of their data. And when I say should, what I mean is when we, somebody following the care principles should be uh, making sure that this is implemented in their data uh, system. Uh, Indigenous people have that right. It's up to those handling data to make sure that that's recognized. Responsibility, uh, Indigenous data should be uh, linked to relationships built on respect, positive relationships. It should uh, involve a reciprocal responsibility to enhance data literacy. Uh, and it must be grounded in the languages, worldviews, and lived experiences of Indigenous peoples. And ethical, uh, it should minimize harm and maximize benefit. Uh, the processes involved should address imbalances in power and resources. Um, and data governance should take into account potential future use and also pay attention to potential future harm uh, of data that has been collected as part of a research project involving Indigenous uh, people and Indigenous data. So about me, uh, I was trained, as, as I guess you can kind of tell from what was mentioned about me at the very beginning, as a Germanic philologist. Uh, specializing in pre-conquest medieval English. My thesis in 1996 was on manuscript variation in Old English poetry. Uh, more specifically, it was actually a study of every single textual variant in the corpus of Old English poetry. Um, I, in 2005, I did an early digital edition of an Old English poem, Cadman's Hymn. Um, and I've been working for about a decade on the Visionary Cross. Uh, not always as the main focus of, of my research, um, but as off and on, certainly, and, and thinking through what has actually turned out to be a very complex set of data problems. Um, I say interested recently, what I mean is since my PhD uh, in standards, I've been uh, chair of the TEI, I've been uh, president of Force 11, I've done a fair bit of work on linked open data as well. And I've also, I think, probably like many of us, um, become quite interested in decolonizing and unsettling, particularly the digital humanities. Um, I, I was one of the founders of GoDH, the Global Outlook Digital Humanities uh, Organization, which was really aimed at helping to foster what became, I think, the global turn in digital humanities in the, the beginning of this uh, of the current decade. 
Um, and this is a much bigger issue and a, and a very live issue in Canada right now, increasingly live. Um, you may have seen my uh, thing that goes on when my camera is not on. Uh, that's because the degree to which the residential schools in Canada uh, engaged in uh, what is often called a, a cultural or linguistic genocide is becoming clear, but also the degree to which uh, uh, physical harm was done to uh, the people who were in these schools is becoming extremely clear. And all research in Canada is taking place now uh, and, and, and all university teaching uh, and administration is taking place in the context of a Truth and Reconciliation Commission that we had in the last decade that had a number of rec uh, recommendations for indigenization of the academy and also for uh, what I would call unsettling the way that we work to remove uh, systemic bias and systemic, uh, um, well, systemic racism, uh, particularly against indigenous peoples. And so this is definitely affecting my own work and how I think about my classes and my research. So the Visionary Cross Project, as I said, is about a decade old and its goal is to produce an edition and an archive of what we call the visionary cross uh, cultural matrix in Anglo-Saxon England. I'm sorry, actually that snuck in. Uh, this is from an older slide that I copied over uh, without uh, recognizing this. And by addition, what I mean is a scholarly mediated reproduction. Uh, by archive, I mean a data set of facsimiles and transcriptions. And by the cultural matrix, I mean a collection of individual objects that also belong together for cultural reasons. So we have uh, what we're going to be what we're working with are some of the best known objects from uh, pre-conquest England. Uh, uh, the Dream of the Root poem, which is an extremely well-known old English poem, it's found in the Vercelli book manuscript, uh, which is uh, in Vercelli near uh, Turin in Italy. The Ruthwell cross, which is a stone cross uh, in Ruthwell Church um, in uh, Dumfries and Carlisle in Scotland. The Bewcastle Cross, which is near, uh, sorry, Dumfries and Galloway. Uh, the Bewcastle Cross, which is near Carlisle, uh, also a uh, uh, pre-conquest uh, stone cross. And the Brussels Cross, which is uh, a 10th or 11th century uh, gilded cross that's now found in Brussels Cathedral, but was uh, somewhere in England and, and was manufactured in the South. And these are objects that are uh, first of all, well known. I mean, the Dream of the Root is a poem that anybody who studied Old English has probably read. Um, it's uh, they're intrinsically interesting. They're also interesting for a variety of reasons. Uh, the poem that is found in the Vercelli book is found carved in runes on the Ruthwell cross, even though it's a different dialect and a hundred years difference in terms of when it was copied. And it seems to be quoted in the mark of the edge of the Brussels cross. And this is all very unique or very uh, interesting because, uh, for example, only 3% of the Old English poetic corpus is found more than once. Uh, so the fact that this is found three times uh, makes it extremely unusual. And there's only two examples in the entire Old English poetic corpus of quotation. Uh, and this is one of them. The other is a quotation from the Psalms, which is what you'd much more expect. So our project, going back 15 years ago, uh, probably when we first started pitching it, was very complex. We wanted to do, there was new scanning technology at the time, we wanted to make 3D models of the crosses, and we also wanted to use, we were thinking at the time of the Wikipedia, but we wanted to use predictive linking uh, to connect the different objects to each other so that the connections between them was something that we would be editing. And we've also always thought of it as an expansible uh, expandable project, by which we mean um, that others could add to it or reuse our data. So really, to summarize this, uh, basically, it was on the one hand, a traditional high culture oriented research. Uh, but on the other hand, it, it has been actually a very interesting technical problem for digital humanities, for humanities data management, and for editorial theory. And one of the reasons why this project has actually taken so long to do is um, we thought that the technology was better than it was when we started, and the technology is only now catching up the infrastructure in a way that would allow us to do what our original vision for this project was. 
There was something else about this project, though, and that was this was my first time working with artifacts in the real world. As you saw, I'm a Germanic philologist. I've worked with manuscripts. I've worked with uh, transcriptions of manuscripts. Uh, I've worked with things in libraries. I'd never worked with things that actually have a location. And so this led me to three new realizations. Uh, the first is that objects have locations in a way that I'd never really thought of before. Um, I, I know that manuscripts are in certain libraries, but to be honest, once you're in one library, you've been in all libraries. They vary a little bit, but not that much. Even rare book libraries. Sure, the Beinecke is something completely different from the Vatican Library, but also it's not. Uh, libraries are ultimately libraries. But these things have locations. Uh, the Ruthwell Cross is located in Ruthwell. That's just down the road from Hottam, which I'll talk about in a little bit, uh, a Roman and medieval site. And it's about 20 miles from View Castle, uh, which is just across the border in England, in Carlisle, um, the modern border. These things are all very close to Lockerbie uh, of uh, uh, the fame from that uh, terrorist attack, um, which is also not uh, irrelevant. This is a group of people who understand themselves as a community, a cross-border community, but they understand themselves as belonging uh, to each other. Um, and even once you're there, these things are located uh, in the surrounding area. I'm sure this is not a surprise for somebody who's uh, better trained than I am, but it was a surprise for me as a philologist to really understand this. So the Bucastle Cross is located in the middle of the picture there, uh, just outside, you can actually see it, uh, just outside the cross, the church, uh, and where it says cross and church. Um, there's an interpretive center that I'm going to talk about later. There's the edge of a Roman fort and a Roman bath. Longbar is a site where there's something connected to the Bucastle Cross, potentially. Uh, it's a, a couple of miles down the road. There's a much later medieval castle there, and there's a modern farm. Uh, and all of this is, uh, 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 and actually there's a, a manse, the the minister's house at the very bottom of that picture there. And all of these fields belong either to the manse or to that farm. And they also have history. They're understood as having history. So these are along the, the Hadrian's Wall area. Um, but the people themselves understand them as taking place in the history of their area. And this was the other thing that was probably most surprising to me. I mean, again, this is shameful for me not to realize this, but it's the nature of my training, I, I think, I hope. Uh, they have owners. They have people who see these objects as belonging to them. So this is uh, the old uh, interpretive center at Bucastle. Uh, what you're seeing on the wall is a project from a local uh, high school uh, to and community college to produce an interpretation of the Bucastle Cross. Um, they've in fact got multiple owners. Uh, the person standing there with me as we're working on the uh, on a stone from the Ruthwell Cross, probably actually from a, a, a lintel, uh, is a representative of Historic Scotland, um, whom I needed permission for from in order to do the scanning, and who closed the church for me while I was doing this. But here, the person standing to my left is Robert Broach who is the husband of the deacon who runs the church. Um, and you can't see it, but his family have been in this area forever. Um, and going back, I believe at least a hundred years, his family being responsible for supplying the uh, flowers uh, for the altar. Uh, you can't see them, but there's usually really beautiful flowers there. Uh, and it's his family have uh, done the, supplied that for years. So since the thing is recorded, I'm not going to tell one of these stories, but I'll tell the other three stories. Um, this has some implications, the fact that these things have locations and owners. Um, so the first implication was whether or not the church was open. Uh, as I said, I needed permission from Historic Scotland to, uh, to scan the cross and to scaffold it. We had scaffolding all around it. And Historic Scotland put up signs uh, saying that the church was closed and that if you wanted access to the church, you were to call a number in uh, Edinburgh and they would send somebody around uh, to see if your desire to visit the church wouldn't interfere with the research that I was doing. Um, Robert also owns the church, uh, he and his community, 
And they, I think quite correctly, felt that this was quite uh, an imposition from historic Scotland on the local community whose church it actually is. And so one of the things that happened was we had competing signs. Uh, historic Scotland came and put signs up and then uh, the local church community came and took those signs down and put up a sign saying that if you wanted access to the church, you were to call a local member, I think it was the rectory, and that they would come and help uh, give you access to the church. The other thing, because these things are placed, they have locations, um, they have modern histories as well, in a way that, you know, obviously, as somebody who works with manuscripts, I'm used to, but um, even more so. So one of the things we noticed as we were scanning, especially at very high resolutions, was these knife cuts that were all over the cross. And I've marked two of them here with this uh, red box. And these are 19th century things. Uh, the, the colored bit of this is a cast that I believe, I've forgotten now exactly, there's one in Leeds and the other I think is in Durham Museum. And if you look across the bottom of uh, the angels there, you can see the line that's the, where the knife cut comes from, and it's the cut they made in the 19th century to take the plaster cast off in order to make the plaster casting. But that's not the only re, uh, modern uh, imposition. Uh, it's very, very hard to see this, but uh, that's pencil on top of the cross, and it says probably W. Alston. Um, and here's another one. And this says, I, I'm don't remember and can't quite read what it says on the very top part, but the bottom bit says newbie, uh, N-E-W-B-I-E. And so what is Olson and newbie? Well, again, these things have local histories we were asking, and it turns out these are probably artifacts from about 1980 when um, the church was repainted and they hired a company and everybody was pretty sure that the guys who worked for that painting company came from the local nearby towns of Alston and Newby. And so this was them writing on this cross uh, that they were there, I guess, sort of a, a Scottish rural version of Kilroy was here. Oops, sorry. And then uh, the last point I had was the story of research. And something else that I had was the people that we work with were, of course, extremely interested in, in their cross. Um, but one of the things that really shocked and ashamed me, I have to say as a scholar, was the degree to which uh, nobody had told them the results of any of their research. So it was very interesting talking to, you know, the old uh, deacon, for example, and he had memories of dealing with some very famous uh, researchers in my field going back to the 50s. Um, and he never knew the result of their work. He didn't know some of the major books that had been published about the work that he contributed to and he didn't know about. Another reason why it's got real world implications is um, there's in fact two versions of the history of this area. There's an official version and we're looking at um, a sign for Hotham um, the, put up by Historic Scotland. And there's the local and we've already seen this uh, picture. This is a picture of the interpretive center, the previous interpretive center at Bewcastle. And this is a picture of a variety of things that had been put together by the local church in Ruthwell as well, uh, a sign outside. And these are all things that they composed and put up, uh, various signs in the church. And right in the middle, these very handy paddles in multiple languages that you can pick up and hold and look at the church at the cross. And then it explains in your language, it's got French, German, Dutch, um, Italian, uh, explains what each of the uh, panels that you're looking at is. And there's a big difference in the quality of the interpretation that takes place on the site. Um, but it's not probably what we as professional researchers would expect or hope. Um, the Bew Castle, again, this is the previous version, but the Bew Castle one is reasonably detailed and accurate. Uh, it's a little bit out of date, but it was done in the late 80s. Um, and it's quite comprehensive and it really has thought through what would you like to know about this site that goes from Rome right up until well now. Um, the Ruthwell is a little bit dated. Some of the material of the book, for example, is based on a 19th century or early 20th century book. And some of the material that they've got is a little bit dated, uh, but again, accurate and extremely handy. These paddles are, are used a lot and are very, very useful. This is contrasted to Historic Scotland. So this is the site at Hotham, admittedly, so different. But were you to read through this, 
uh, what you'll discover is an awful lot about Glasgow and not so much about Hotham, because it turns out Hotham was a monastery that it was a daughter monastery of Glasgow. And so it in fact invites you to go to different places in Glasgow uh, rather than different places in the local region. But as my graduate student, Heather Hotma pointed out, a graduate student at the time pointed out in her thesis, it's also bizarrely unhandy as a site. So the sign that you were just looking at is uh, pointing to, to look at it you have to be looking in the direction of the bottom arrow. That is to say, you're standing looking towards the river as you read that sign. But the actual monastery at Hottam to which it refers is not in front of you. You're not standing on it. It's on the hillside behind. In fact, so far away, we had to get a different picture to show you where it is. Um, and so as you're looking at this sign explaining how the monastery at Hottam worked, you're actually not looking at all at any evidence of it. The, mo the monastery started at the tree line that you can see uh, to the left and it went up the hill. Um, and so you actually can't see anything that they're talking about as you read their sign, which is pointing you to Glasgow anyway. So when I was first confronted with this, um, I, I was taken by surprise. And the reason was, and again, this is to my shame, uh, I was what at the time I thought of as an Anglo-Saxonist, which uh, is appropriate term to use in this case because it's a made, well, a more or less made up term that was defined in the 19th century to define the field uh, for a variety of fairly colonial reasons. But I thought that old English things, or I guess as I thought at the time, Anglo-Saxon things belonged to me. I mean, that's why I'd been to graduate school. That's why I had my PhD. That's why I was here uh, with all this funding that I brought. Um, but I was also really struck very rapidly after that by shame, um, especially when I was talking to uh, people who'd done such a good job uh, displaying the material, but had not, we as scholars had not given back to the community. This is a key phrase that's used in Indigenous research in, in Canada, which has really got me thinking about this. And in essence, we had an extractive colonial relationship between scholarship and the community. And so for many years, I worried about this, and I still do. Um, academia is slow. Uh, it's been just under 10 years since, I, since those pictures in Rothwell were taken, and we still don't have an edition published. Some of the data is available, and we're hoping to get it up in the next year. But, uh, you know, academia is slow. There's competing priorities. There's funding comes and goes. Um, we've made some attempts to do things, but again, it's academia, so not everything works the way you wished. Uh, sometimes you end up proving the theory rather than the practice. So we'd hope to do some more tourism work in the last decade, but our, our, the attempts that we made didn't work out because it was too complicated and, and so on. Um, fortunately, we'd long had plans for an extensible addition, although as I said at the very beginning, uh, it's only now that we're starting to see the infrastructure that I think would allow this. And it still is our goal, and I think the infrastructure is now allowing it, and this is where the talk comes. Uh, to allow this uh, material to be reused by local communities for about their objects. And so this is where the work in progress or my thinking comes in. As we've been exploring ways of taking our original decade old, decade and a bit old idea for this edition and really putting it into a fair linked open data research data management infrastructure, the, the issue of how do we deal with that really colonial relationship to the people whose objects these are, uh, can we use this new technology to do that? And if our interest is decolonizing uh, this previously colonial relationship, can care offer the way forward in, for, in order for us to deal with this? One reason to think it might is that a fair research uh, data management infrastructure, especially using PIDs and some work that I'm about to show you on using uh, things like Zenodo and essentially as a kind of restful interface, um, allows a much more generous sharing of data than ever has been possible before. And one of the really big changes that we've been struggling with but are trying to do with the Visionary Cross is rethink of it as we've always thought of it as being a digital version of, in essence, a book. 
but to rethink of it instead as a data cloud with analysis, different kinds of analysis, tourist analysis, scholarly analysis, other people's analysis. Um, and CARE is extremely interesting in that regard because of its focus on decolonization, unsettling, and putting it at the forefront of data use. And so I think FAIR provides a mechanism by which CARE can work, and that's where we're really thinking right now. I'm going to skip through a couple of these. Uh, this is just to give you a quick overview of how we're imagining our work is going, and, and we've already started uh, prototyping this a little bit. But basically what we're doing right now is putting uh, our objects into Zenodo, which is the strongest of the, um, of the repositories for what we need to do. Uh, and we're essentially building, um, we're trying to build this edition almost like an EXO edition, if I could use that term, describing, describing individual objects and their metadata that have been put in Zenodo. So this is showing you how you would do this. We've got metadata on, for instance, a 3D scan. Uh, this is down in the mid left of the screen. Um, metadata with maybe a 3D scan of the Ruthwell cross. And then we've got a much higher object that would be metadata describing the Ruthwell cross, the real world object. And then you looking at it through the website would be drawing on these uh, uh, using DOIs uh, in the case of Zenodo, you would be looking at something that would be built for your use from the data repository. I realize this is very complex. There's another picture that shows it a bit more. So I'm just actually gonna skip um, to a picture of how the scholarly edition might work. This is, again, we've started prototyping this. It does work in principle. Um, so for example, uh, what we would have is a metadata description of the Ruthwell cross, the real world object. Um, we would have objects in Zenodo that contain metadata descriptions plus binaries, data, uh, point clouds, or 2D photography, or, or even XML, not binaries admittedly, but XML transcriptions. And the, the human readable scholarly edition is produced by a website which draws on the repository as a data server rather than as an object. My edition of Cadman's hymn, if you go to the link that I provided at the very beginning of this, when you go there, that's a self-contained website. If you want a transcription of Cadman's hymn, any other versions, you go to that website and you go find my transcriptions. If you want a photo, same thing. What we're imagining is that in fact, that the data would be distributed and the edition would pull it all together using in fact PIDs uh, as a transport mechanism. And the reason why this gets uh, very interesting in terms of its ability to operationalize care is the ability it means to let other people use the data that we collected and to also in help and encourage other people to use the data. So once you've got your data into some uh, repository like Zenodo, for example, it's easy to have other people reuse it uh, because the same transport mechanism that allowed us to produce our edition is available to others. So this hypothetically, this was built thinking about scholarship, but you could see how this would relate to a tourist uh, uh, application, for example. Let's say a different team was working on the Bucastle Cross, that's the bottom. They could show the connections to the Ruthwell Cross by linking to our metadata and our objects. They could also draw uh, our material into their edition. You would never uh, necessarily know where it came from other than the attribution that's preserved in Zenodo. And they could also add different commentary, competing commentary uh, to our work. Um, and again, I'm thinking of this now in terms of could we use this to give back to the community? So uh, this is obviously very fast through how we're trying to work with this. Um, but, and, and it's very preliminary thoughts in terms of ethics and data. But the thing that I'm doing here is trying to tie it to a specific European and medieval focused project. Um, and it seems to me that there's a lot we can learn from the care uh, data uh, protocols as we think about our own objects. Um, probably in the case of manuscripts, this is less pressing in some ways because the manuscripts have been longer in many, many cases have been longer uh, in the world of academia. And in that sense are uh, part of our infrastructure. 
but certainly when it comes to objects, um, it seems to me that there's a lot of space for us to learn from what's going on with Indigenous research and Indigenous data uh, research data management. But like I said, I am a little bit concerned about the way my thinking's going because of this All Lives Matter program uh, problem. I, I can see parallels to what I'm looking at when I'm dealing with these objects and their communal uh, location, uh, the, the degree to which they're fixed in the uh, community. But I don't want to uh, claim that it's uh, an equivalency in any way. The reason why the care data standards were put together was to address the particular problems that come from settler indigenous relationships and that, the, that specific colonial relationship. And I don't think that we should be claiming that all uh, owners of data are uh, in, in quotes indigenous. I think we want to understand um, why that approach uh, as captured in care is useful for the rest of us to understand, but also to be humble and to recognize the degree to which we need to learn from that relationship rather than frankly extract it and use it for our own. And so, but I do think that there's an awful lot to be gained from adopting the kind of unsettled mindset that we're increasingly encouraged to adopt, at least in the Canadian academia, uh, as we think about the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, as we think about the goal of indigenizing the academy, I wonder if there's not a respectful way in which we can use this idea of unsettling indigenous data to do a better job of handling the data that we collect in other contexts as well. Thanks. I think I can open this up for questions and comments at this point, and I'll stop sharing. Thank you.